means he cannot look beyond his work, which means that the work dominates him. The work is essential and the writer has become inessential. So when the writer is writing a work, he has discovered certain relationships in nature or in the world. Therefore, the writer was essential for writing the work. But once the work has been written, then uh, the work becomes essential and the writer becomes inessential. This dialectic is nowhere more apparent than in the art of writing, for the literary object is a peculiar talk which exists only in movement, using a metaphor of a top. Young boys play with tops. Uh, tops spin very fast and when they spin, then they stand vertically. But when the movement is not there, when it loses its speed, then it falls flat. So it is the movement uh, in which this top can stand, it can exist when there is movement. Similarly, a literary work can exist, can appear when it is in movement. To make it come into a view, a concrete act called reading is necessary and it lasts only as long as this act can last. So the literary work, in order to exist like a top can stand only when it is moving or spinning. Similarly, a literary work can exist before our eyes only when we are reading it. Which means that a reader is this is it. All the work is Beyond that, there are only black marks on paper. Now the writer cannot read what he writes. Whereas the shoemaker can put on the shoes he has just made, if they are his size, and the architect can live in the house he has built. So, a writer cannot read his work. Read in the sense that he is reading as a stranger, and therefore a stranger who has an objective distance from the work can read it and can assign or extract its significance. A writer cannot do that in his own work. So a writer is not like a shoemaker who can put on his own shoes if they are on his side. In reading one foresees, one waits, one forces the end of the sentence, the following sentence, the next page. One waits for them to confirm or disappoint one's foresight. The reading is composed of a host of hypotheses, of dreams followed by awakenings, of hopes and deceptions. Because a reader is a stranger to the world, therefore he proceeds by making hypotheses, assumptions, he hopes the sentence or the page or the book itself, the novel, to end in a particular fashion and if it doesn't then he is disappointed or he is surprised. So all these things make his reading unique. But all these things will not happen with the writer because the writer knows everything about the book. The readers are always ahead of the sentences they are reading in a nearly probable future which partly collapses and partly comes together in proportion as the progress, which withdraws from one page to the next and forms the moving, moving horizon of the literary object. So gradually the horizon unfolds to a reader. Without waiting, without a future, without ignorance, there is no objectivity. So these sentences are very aphoristic. Waiting, ignorance, and the future. These must be there, otherwise, there is no issue. For a writer, there is no such thing. 
so what happens when a writer reads his own work? You can still read it literally. You can read it. Uh, so what he is doing is that uh, the function of his gaze is not to reveal by brushing against them the sleeping words which are waiting to be read, but to control the sketching of the signs. In short, it is a purely regulating mission. And the view before him reveals nothing except for the slight slips of the pen. <laughs> when the writer reads his own work, it is more likely that he will discover the defects, the slips of his pen, but he will not be able to discover any new revelation. The writer neither forces nor conjectures, he projects. He projects. Uh, a writer cannot anticipate, foresee or wait for a meaning to unfold. One can do that for another, but for one's own work it is not possible to wait. If the author existed alone, he would be able to write it as much as he liked. The work as object would never see the light of day, and he would either have to put down his pen or the pen. That is, uh, when an author creates a work, stops writing, and then leaves it to the world, and to the world, the work becomes a literary object which can be investigated. But it will never become an object to the author himself. So the conclusion is, uh, but before that, but the operation of writing implies that of reading as its dialectical correlative and these two connected acts necessitates two distinct agents. So this is the conclusion that the operation of writing will necessitate reading. There must be another person who is the reader. And unless the writer and the reader collaborate, the literary work of the object cannot be told. There is no art except for and by others. One cannot write for oneself. One cannot write without others. Uh, which means that writing essentially is a social act because you are taking into consideration others and without others participation the work is not complete. Reading seems in fact to be the synthesis of perception and creation which supposes the essentiality of both the subject and the object. Perception and creation, these are the two dialectical sides of a work of art, or you may say of reading. And here reading does not mean only reading of a book. Uh, it could be reading of a sculpture or a music, piece of music or so on. Uh, in a footnote art says, the same is true in different degrees. Regarding the spectator's attitude before art, other works of art, paintings, symphonies, statues, which supposes the essentiality of both the subject and the object. The object is essential because it is strictly transcendent, because it imposes its own structures, and because one must wait for it and observe it. The essentiality of both the subject and the object, you have to be uh, very careful that we do not miss the nuances here. Essence and existence. Uh, according to idealist philosophy, essence precedes existence. According to existentialist philosophy, existence precedes essence. So, what is essential? What has essentiality? Does the subject have essentiality? 
or does the object have a substitute? The answer is both. If a work of art has to be made, so object, the object, the work of art itself, it is transcendent because it imposes its own structures. Transcendent means it transcends the subject. The author does not have any control once the work of art is distanced from him as an object. Then it becomes transcendent, it has its own structure and everything which can be read only by a reader. Uh, but the subject is also essential because it is required not only to disclose the object, it is to make it possible for there to be an object, but also so that this object might exist absolutely, that is to produce it. So the subject, the work of art or the object becomes essential in the sense that it is transcendent, it transcends the author, it has its own structure and so on, one has to wait for it. Similarly, the author, the writer, the subject is also essential because it is he who in the first place brings this work into existence, makes it happen. Um, and then it exists absolutely which means that it produces. So when something is produced, then it becomes an absolute existence. In a word, the reader is conscious of disclosing and creating, of creating by uh, disclosing. The reader is conscious of disclosing in creating. That is, the act of reading is also some kind of a creation because it discloses something. Or creating by disclosing is an act of creation as it discloses. <laughs> In reality, it is not necessary to believe that reading is a mechanical operation and that science makes an impression upon him as light does on a photographic plate. Uh, if he is inattentive, tired, stupid, or thoughtless, most of the relations will escape him. So reading is not a mechanical operation. Sartre gives a very uh, easy to understand example. So a mechanical operation like you expose a photographic film to light, it will mechanically absorb the light. But the act of reading is not mechanical. You must be solely focused on it attentive to it, because a, right, a reader starts to imagine, may be stupid or may be tired or may be both and then when he is or she is reading, she would miss all the important points, which can sometimes happen to all of us. How many times we have fallen asleep with a book in our hands? So when we are very sleepy, then we miss all that is there in the book. The book will not magically, you know, uh, transmit its ideas into you if you are not attentive to it. He will never manage to catch on to the object in the sense in which you see that fire catches or does not catch. He will draw some phrases out of the shadow, but they will seem to appear as random strokes. If he is at his best, he will project beyond the words a synthetic form, each phrase of which will be no more than a partial function, the theme, the subject, or the meaning. Such kind of, uh, you know, mocks uh, the attempt of critics to read books by certain catchphrases, like the theme, the subject, meaning, and so on. So these are only partial. Uh, 
partial disclosure. Thus, from the, from the very beginning, the meaning is no longer contained in the words, since it is he, on the contrary, who allows the significance of each of them to be understood. If the words were self-sufficient, and it contained all the meanings, then you give me a book to read, <coughs> and you give the same book to Frederick Nietzsche to read, and you also read the book yourself. All these three readings will be the same, like as in a pill, in a capsule, the ingredient, the drug is the same. Whoever consumes it will consume the same thing. But that does not happen with the book. So I read this essay in a particular way, I understand something. You understand something that will not be identical with what I understand. And you give it Frederick Nietzsche to read or Jacques Derrida and he will understand something different. Therefore, it is not the same book. Where lies the difference? The difference lies in our consciousness or our levels of maturity. It is, uh, therefore, an act of consciousness upon this literary object. The literary object, though realized through language, is never given in language. On the contrary, it is by nature a silence and an opponent of the world. This is a very pregnant uh, expression. Not everything can be expressed by words. Therefore, every word contains a lot which are not expressed but are evoked. So there is a lot of silence in any work which leads to be there. In addition, the hundred thousand words aligned in a book can be read one by one so that the meaning of the work does not emerge. If you read the words one by one, then you do not get the meaning. You must read sentences or paragraphs or chapters, then meaning will partially be revealed to you. But then you read the entire novel and try to find its meaning. Then you have a holistic understanding of the book. Therefore, what is your unit of attention? How much of the book you are reading at one time? That is also important. Nothing is accomplished if the reader does not put himself from the very beginning and almost without a guide at the height of the silence. If in short he does not invent it and does not then place there and hold on to the words and sentences which he awakens. The reader has to evoke or invoke this silence, puts himself ahead of the silence. Uh, and if I am told that it would be more fitting to call this operation a reinvention or a discovery, I shall answer that first such a reinvention would be as new and as original an act as the first invention. So the reader's work is equally a work of creation or a work of invention as that of the writer. To understand this is very significant because uh, it helps us understand how Sartre imagines that writing is an act of collaboration between writer and reader. To some extent, it reminds us of uh, the of what Malarme had said about his poetry. When somebody asked the meaning of his poetry, then Malarme said that the meaning that you give to it, that is its meaning. Which means that every reader brings to a work a unique consciousness, a unique imagination, 
therefore every region is an act of creation no less significant than the act of writing the book itself. It is the absence of words, the undifferentiated and lived silence of inspiration till the word is then particularized whereas the silence produced by the reader is an object. Uh, which means that Sartre suggests that as the words in a work are important in their particular use, similarly the silence that is produced by any reader, that is also an object which has to be read. The silence produced by the reader. Which is that when we are reading a book, we are in a constant dialogue with it. We are not speaking out, but it acts out in our mind. And this dialogue, which is not spoken, which is in silence, that is the addition, that is the contribution by the reader. And this silence also must be there. And at the very interior of this object there are more silences which the author does not mention. Any author is blind to certain aspects of his work or of his society. He does not mention a number of things in his work. And it is possible to read those silences. And by understanding what are the things that the author didn't say or the author suppressed, one can arrive at a different understanding of the work. This is to some extent like uh, Jacques Derrida's deconstruction theory. So Derrida follows this method in deconstruction. That he reads a work and by looking at the different possible significations, because many words have plural significations, by looking at the different possible significations which are not obvious, Derrida arrives at a very different interpretation, sometimes the opposite of what was the apparent signification intended by the author in the world. That is deconstruction. It is a question of silences which are so particular that they could not retain any meaning outside the object which the reading causes to appear. However, it is these which give its, its density and its particular place. The, uh, Sartre comes to the question of ideas in a world which cannot be expressed or are inexpressible. To say that they are unexpressed is hardly the word, but they are precisely the inexpressible. They cannot be expressed. And that is why one does not come upon them at any definite moment in the reading. They are everywhere and nowhere. They are all pervasive. The quality of the marvelous in Le Grand Noël, uh, which is a novel by Alain Fournier, uh, the grandioseness of Armos. Armos is a novel by Stendhal. The degree of realism and truth of Kafka's mythology, these are never given. So these are things which are there, which are all pervasive, but they have not been expressed. The marvelous in Fournier's novel, the grandioseness in Stendhal's novel, and the realism in the doctor. The reader must invent them all in a continual exceeding of the written thing. Very significant. But if the reader cannot limit himself to what has been written, he must also look at that which has not been written. So he has to exceed the written thing. To be sure, the author guides him, but all he does is guide him. The landmarks he set up are separated by the void. The reader must unite them. He must go beyond them. 
In short, reading is directed field. So there are certain landmarks which indicate the areas or the thoughts which have not been spoken, which have not been written. The reader must connect these landmarks and articulate that unspoken significance. On the one hand, the literary object has no other substance than the reader's subjectivity. Raskolnikov's waiting is my waiting, which I lend you. Sartre refers to a character in uh, Dostoevsky's novel Crime and Punishment, this character Raskolnikov. So he says that the reader identifies himself with the character. So Raskolnikov's waiting is my waiting, which I lend him. Without this impatience of the reader, uh, he would remain only a collection of signs. His hatred of the police magistrate who questions him is my hatred. So where do the characters get these emotions from? These emotions are basically the emotions of the reader. The reader lends these emotions to the character so that they become real. And the police magistrate himself would not exist without the hatred I have for him. That is what animates him. It is his very flesh. So by the emotions of the reader, these characters become real. But on the other hand, the words are there like traps to arouse our feelings and to reflect them towards us. Each word is a path of transcendence. It shapes our feelings, names them, and attributes them to an imaginary personage who takes it upon himself to leave them for us and who has no other substance than these borrowed passions. Beautifully written. The characters of the novel, they have no substance and their passions are only borrowed from the reader. The comforts, objects, perspectives and a horizon of the Who comforts? This character. But where does he get his perspective? From the reader. So, the ultimate analysis, the reader confers the perspective and significance to the novel. Thus for the reader, all is to do and all is already done. See so how beautifully and aphoristically expressed. All is to do means the reader has to do a lot. What does he have to do? He has to lend his emotions to the characters while reading. And all is already done. That means all the actions have already been uh, written by the author. But those actions will be without emotions unless the reader lends the emotion. The work exists only at the exact level of his capacities when he reads and creates. That is what I was telling you capacity of the reader, the work will exist according to the capacity of the reader. So, I read Sartre's What is Literature, you read it and Raghdarida reads it. The readings will be according to the capacities of the reader and therefore they will be different. When he reads and creates, he knows that he can always go farther in his reading, can always create more profoundly and that the work seems to him as inexhaustible and opaque as things. Inexhaustible and opaque as things. Uh, a book. When a reader reads a work, he always feels that he has understood the work to some level, but there is more to be done. There is more in the work which he has not yet understood. So a work appears opaque to him, like a thing. The most mysterious object in our whole world is what we call an object or a thing. Because a thing is opaque, we know nothing about it. It does not communicate with us. We would readily reconcile that rational intuition which can't Reserved to divine reason with this absolute production of qualities, 
which to the extent that we emanate from our subjectivity, conjure before our eyes into impenetrable objectivities. Kant believes that reason is the origin of certain uh, concepts or principles. God is the ens uh, realismus, uh, the most real being that must be. Kant uh, believes that reason is the origin of certain concepts and God is the reality, ens realismus, uh, the most real being. Uh, that can be assumed. It is a concept. What is reality? We can call it, we can imagine, say, that the greatest reality is God. Absolute reality is God. Hence, realism is called it. Consists of certain rational principles. So here we see the, you know, 17th century uh, glorification of reason, particularly by Descartes and others, later Newton and others. This glorification of reason uh, that we also see in Kant, the rationalistic trend of philosophy, uh, which was vigorously challenged and altered by the intervention of Friedrich Nietzsche. The trend of philosophy of unreason. But in many ways, even today we are living in uh, the world, in a world that believes in reason, uh, but Nietzsche's thought, thoughts and his works, uh, the seeds that he planted uh, of the philosophy of unreason that to some extent now has come to bear fruit in postmodernism and very recent theories. So such is that uh, rational intuition can be reconciled uh, with absolute production. We would readily reconcile that rational intuition, uh, which can't result to reason with this absolute production of qualities, which to the extent that we emanate from our subjectivity, congeal before our eyes into intellectual objectivity. So intuition, subjectivity, these words, they all, intuition and emanation, where do we get these ideas? They all come from, from the idealist philosophical trend which was handed down by Plato. And, uh, such suggests that uh, in the process of reading, these intuitions, these emanations, uh, these subjectivities, they all tend to become congealed, that is frozen, into a mystery, which is a thing or an object. So subjectivity becomes finally objectified. Uh, when we read a book, when we fail to understand the book anymore, <laughs> I am speaking in simple language, when we fail to understand a book anymore, then the book has become opaque to us, it has become an object to us, an impenetrable object, and our subjectivity comes to a halt, it becomes congealed, it cannot understand it anymore. Is it clear? 
Yes, sir. Since the creation can find its fulfillment only in reading, since the artist must entrust to another the object of carrying out what he has begun, since it is only through the consciousness of the reader that he can regard himself as essential to his work, all literary work is an appeal. Another important uh, idea that Sartre uh, introduces in this essay, the idea of an appeal. The work by a writer, a literary work, it is an appeal to the reader that you please read it, you please intervene, look at it objectively so that its significance can be extracted, can be revealed. In French, appel, appeal, also means call. So it is a call, calling out to the reader. It is as much a call as it is an appeal. But please read it. Please collaborate with me. Only then the meaning of the work will be given. To write is to make an appeal to the reader that he lead into objective existence the revelation which I have undertaken by means of language. And if it should be asked to what the writer is appealing, the answer is simple. As the sufficient reason for the appearance of the aesthetic object is never found either in the book where we find mere, mere disqualifications to produce the object or in the author's mind and as his subjectivity which he cannot get away from, cannot give a reason for the act of reading into its objectivity. The appearance of the work of art is a new event which cannot be explained by anterior data. Safri is using scholastic term, kind of scholastic term, when he is using the phrase uh, sufficient cause. Sufficient reason. And he means sufficient cause. So, uh, as you know that uh, in scholastic logic, cause was a very important concept, logical concept. So, instrumental cause, final cause, and so on, different kinds of causes. Here he, he does not use the, perhaps does not use the word cause, but uh, maybe in the French uh, original version, I will have to check. Even if uh, cause is translated as reason, so what is the reason for the appearance of the aesthetic object? The literary work can become an aesthetic object only when it is perceived, because that is the meaning of aesthesis, the Greek word aesthesis from which we have aesthetic, aesthesis means perception. So when the work is perceived by a, another, by a reader, then it becomes an aesthetic object. But what triggers, or what causes that the literary work would appear as an aesthetic object? Not the author, not the book. In the book we find only solicitation to produce the object. Not in the author's mind as a subjectivity which he cannot get away from the author cannot have objectivity. So, the, what, what triggers this fact that the book will appear as an aesthetic object or as a work of art is a new event. That cannot be explained by an anterior data. So, here it contradicts 
in the determinism of Marxism. According to Marxist theory, uh, the events, any event which happens, can be explained by anterior actions as a dialectic of cause and effect. We have started to say that. Anterior data does not help us uh, understand why a particular work will appear as an aesthetic object. Now, what will ensure that it is read aesthetically by a reader? And since this directed creation is an absolute beginning, it is therefore brought about by the freedom of the reader. So, reading is always a matter of chance. That says elsewhere. So, what would ensure that there is, there are so many books in my bookshelf? What is the probability that I will pick up a particular book from the shelf and read it? Mostly it is chance, matter of chance. Therefore, it cannot be explained with earlier uh, data. In a, manner of cause and effect relationship. So you wake up in the morning and you feel like you want to read a few poems and you open a book of poems, you know, say by Jai Goswami and read some poems or some poems and you read them. But this is purely a chance even. Uh, so this whole process of reading is, Sartre calls it a directed creation. You direct your attention to the work and uh, towards certain uh, significances and create a particular reading of the work. Does the writer appeal to the reader's freedom to collaborate? So the reader is free whether he will read a particular book or not. And therefore, he exercises his freedom and picks up a book and reads it. And that is why the writer has to appeal to the reader, please read my book. And the reader therefore collaborates with the writer by reading it. And then the work is produced as an aesthetic object, as a literary work of art. 